So as I mentioned, uh, and uh, Andres told me that uh, you want to, to have something more interactive, so you do not want to sleep, uh, as the task uh, Andrea gave me is a little bit far from what you are doing. Uh. So I need you to, to again log in uh, in WooClub uh, and uh, write this code. I think everybody done it, uh, except for Julia. Julia, yes. you need to speed up. <laughs> And then, then we see, and I hope also from home, uh, from the other sites where you are connected, you can you can log in. So as I mentioned, uh, uh, the keyword of today is uh, immunometabolism, and uh, of course uh, I need we need to start to warm up, uh, and uh, uh, I need to ask you what what is what I'm showing right now. So first of all, let's uh, start with the first point, uh, and. Uh, you should see what is this one what is this and uh, you have uh, four different options uh, on the book lab. is it working okay so go through and uh, and and then we try to revise uh, what is correct uh, you have more or less one minute i'm sure you can see a lot of lines a lot of colors a lot of nice names uh, you have different options uh, could it be the London Cube map? Could it be the ICCB map? Because I was working around this morning and uh, you have many corridors, uh, many stairs, and you have other things. We have a few seconds left, so who has not answered? I, I can even try to show you the opposite. So we, we have some fans saying that maybe it's the London Cube, maybe it's the ICGB. Nobody mentioned Picasso, and I don't know why. So at the end, I'm sure, I mean, everybody knows is the Krebs cycles. 22 mentioned Krebs cycles, which is correct. What I think is important as a biochemist that the Krebs cycle, which is this one here, is only a small part of all the metabolic events that are happening in a cell. And this is relevant because uh, if I would ask you which is a tissue or a cell or an organ that is relevant in terms of metabolism, uh, you will come saying to me for sure is the liver, maybe the pancreas, but then uh, you have to think that all type of cells uh, are uh, using metabolism for many reasons, uh, the most important will be the capability to generate ATP, which is critical, but also it's relevant for many, many, many other functions. And the topic of today, as I mentioned, is try, try to focus on uh, how metabolism is relevant for the function of immune cells. So there is this new word that has been uh, taught uh, 10 years ago, connecting the role of uh, changes in metabolism in immune cells, which is known as immunometabolism, I know there are some fans of uh, immunity here in the room. So in general, we know that different immune cell functions are associated with different metabolic configurations. If you think about uh, resting and patient immune cells, uh, think about uh, naive T lymphocytes, uh, M2 macrophages. Uh, these are cells that are mainly generating energy via classical mechanisms, uh, glyco, uh, glycolysis, uh, coupled uh, to uh, TCA cycle, or uh, uh, lipid oxidation, beta oxidation, coupled to TCA cycles. We also know that as soon as a cell uh, needs to change uh, the phenotype, think about uh, activated and proliferating cells, uh, they really need to speed up uh, uh, the production of ATP, and uh, uh, it is nice to know that uh, they really prefer to run uh, a, uh, what is known as uh, anaerobic glycolysis. So glucose uh, is converted into pyruvate, but then pyruvate is not entering in the mitochondria and uh, uh, going through the TCA cycle, but is rather converted to lactate. And this is uh, what is also known as barbour effect uh, for cancer cells. Uh, and is a process that is less efficient uh, in terms of the amount of glucose that is used to generate a, a certain amount of ATP, but is running very quickly. So most of the activated and proliferating cells, including uh, immune cells, are preferring uh, the valvular effect. And this is true for M1 macrophages or effector T cells. As, uh, as we discussed, uh, uh, how could this be relevant uh, if you move uh, from uh, cell metabolism to a setting uh, where we have uh, a disorder which is associated with an impairment uh, of uh, uh, metabolism? And uh, specifically, I'm a lover of uh, atherosclerosis. And if you focus uh, on the uh, etiopathogenesis of atherosclerosis, 
We know that the atherosclerotic plaque is a site of immune inflammation, meaning what? Meaning that if you look into human atherosclerotic plaques, as well as into mouse model atherosclerotic plaques, you can see a lot of cells uh, related to the innate immune response, uh, including macrophages, uh, B1 cells. Uh, we know that innate immunity in the context of atherosclerosis, but not only, has a low specificity, but uh, possesses a rapid response. On top of that, uh, we also have a lot of cells uh, related to adaptive immunity. They are critical for uh, the recognition of specific molecules, antigens, they have a very high elevated specificity. The uh, response is relatively slow, but could be amplified. And uh, it also possesses a sophisticated regulation. So up to now, we know that uh, the metabolism of immune cells can be modulated, can change depending on which type of immune cells we need in a specific setting. And if we translate this in the context of uh, atherosclerotic disorders, uh, we have all type of immune cells that are represented there. So I will move and focus on uh, one of the uh, potential risk factors, risk factors associated with atherosclerosis, which is cholesterol. And specifically, the question I would like to discuss with you today is how cholesterol metabolism is rewired in immune cells during uh, different uh, physiological and pathological processes. And as I know that uh, uh, we have a lot of PhD students today, we move to question two. I would ask you, and uh, let's see, I, I'm your mentor, I'm your uh, uh, PhD supervisor. Uh, and then we ask you, oh, uh, I need you to come with an excellent idea. And uh, before starting from that, uh, we know that uh, uh, we have to study something related to cholesterol metabolism. So how can I explore whether I would like to uh, investigate is relevant? Uh, so which is what uh, uh, the possible approach that I can use? But what would you do? Would you look into the eyes of your uh, lab mate uh, and try to find uh, the answer to the question? Would you explore PubMed uh, and look for publications on the same topic? So would you like to repeat what has been already done? Would you ask your supervisor can I attend the scientific meeting on the other side of the world just to try to see whether what I would like to do is relevant? Would you look somewhere into all the databases that uh, are there and try to see whether or not uh, uh, there are clinical features of genetic defects uh, related to what you would like to investigate, uh, which perhaps uh, is related to cholesterol metabolism, which is the topic of today? Is this relevant? So time to answer. And then we try, we try to go through. Of course, I know that you are a fan of your, you, you like your lab mate, so you really want to put <laughs> a beer together. Maybe it's, it's not the, 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 the top answer, top choice. So we have a lot of, of, of answers already. So let's go to the numbers. Oh, wow, now, now, now there is no clear indication. So either you will explore PubMed and try to look into the same topic, or maybe you can look into genetic defects that are related to, in our case, to cholesterol metabolism. So it's going on the same direction. A few of you will, uh, will go to your supervisor and ask to go to a meeting on the other side of the world. At least no one will look into the eyes of, the, of your lab mate. So of course, one, one, one important question uh, is, uh, and this is my suggestion for the PhDs, uh, uh, I think it's important that uh, if you want to see what uh, is relevant, uh, is really important uh, at the clinical level, you, need me, you really need to look uh, into the history of the disease uh, from a genetic point of view and see whether this could be relevant for what we're studying. So let's think about cholesterol. You all know that cholesterol is, is a molecule that has free cholesterol, is cytotoxic, and it's, uh, it's important not to accumulate cholesterol within the cells. And therefore, evolution provided us with nice mechanisms to eliminate cholesterol from cells. And there are four key actors that are critical for eliminating cholesterol from most of cells, including immune cells. We have these two transporters. Uh, these are ATP binding cassette transporters known as ABCA1 and ABCG1. And they are only working uh, 
if uh, there are cholesterol acceptors outside from the cells. And the two key acceptors that are known are apolipoprotein E and apolipoprotein A1. So if you would like to understand uh, better if what we are studying is interesting, we need to look into genetic disorders associated with these uh, four key players. And this is what is known up to now. So there is a disease known as uh, Tangier disease. This is a disease related to a loss of function in uh, one of the two transporters, ABCA1. So it's an, an ABCA1 deficiency. And as we are thinking about cholesterol and immune disorders, uh, you have to know that uh, patients with Tangier disease, uh, they uh, present splenomegaly, they have a dramatic accumulation of lipids within tonsils, and this is resulting in an impairment uh, even of the immune response. If you think about uh, uh, deficiency of one of the two acceptors, hypolipoprotein A1, this is known as hypoalpha lipoproteinemia. And the most severe cases, uh, you accumulate a lot of uh, lipids uh, within the skin, for instance. Uh, and uh, uh, in this setting, uh, you attract a lot of uh, inflammatory cells. Uh, so uh, on top of skin lipid deposition, you have a dramatic inflammation, you have an impairment of innate immune response. Patients with severe ap one deficiency, they are at increased risk of uh, dying uh, for infections. Then regarding APOE deficiency, uh, this is known as type 3 hyperlipoproteinemia. And uh, uh, apart from uh, the deposition of lipids uh, in uh, different tissues, uh, uh, patients uh, with this uh, type of genetic disorder, they present retinal inflammation and neurocognitive disease. Just for information, up to now, there are no loss of function mutations reported for ABCG1, the second transporter maybe suggesting that it's so relevant uh, for uh, the function of an organism that uh, uh, the mutations are not, uh, uh, cannot be associated with life. From our perspective uh, as a scientist, uh, then the first point uh, uh, is to try to understand a little bit more about the setting uh, in uh, experimental models that are lacking some of these genes. And uh, I'm sure you, you've heard about uh, apolipoprotein E deficient animals, apolipoprotein E knockout mice, uh, and uh, they are characterized by presenting increased plasma cholesterol levels. But on top of that, uh, they present uh, uh, severe leukocytosis, mainly monocytosis and uh, uh, neutrophilia. And they also present an increased amount of hematopoietic stem cells. So what we did was to look into uh, the different subsets of immune cells uh, in this animal model. And uh, to make a long story short, uh, uh, you can uh, appreciate how adaptive, uh, the adaptive immune response uh, is uh, functioning by looking into the distribution of naive versus activated uh, or memory T lymphocytes. And in this case, what we observed, uh, looking into the blood, the lymph nodes, and the spleen of the knockout in blue versus wild type animals, you can see there is an increase of this subset of lymphocytes known as T effector memory cells. And these are the most aggressive uh, T cells uh, that can be observed uh, in uh, uh, an organism. Is this relevant in terms of function? So is this suggesting that cholesterol metabolism, taking into account that APOE is critical for mobilizing cholesterol from uh, uh, innate and adaptive immune cells toward uh, and back to the liver, is this relevant uh, for the function of the immune system? This was as a simple question, so it's not posed as a question, it's already posed as a classical answer. So for sure, when you want to uh, address uh, whether there is a role for cholesterol metabolism in uh, the immune response, uh, we need to focus on uh, any effect on the dendritic cell function or T cell maturation and expansion. And uh, what we did was to uh, profile uh, the lipidome uh, and the metabolome uh, of dendritic cells uh, uh, isolated from wild type mice and APOE knockout animals. Uh, and uh, by eyes, uh, you can appreciate that there is a different distribution in terms of lipids uh, that are present in uh, knockout dendritic cells versus uh, wild type dendritic cells. You can refer to the paper, it's, it's a long paper. So we did a lot of studies uh, and at the end uh, we uh, discovered uh, that the absence of upper lipoprotein E is impairing uh, the capability of dendritic cells uh, to uh, stabilize uh, specific membrane areas known as lipid rafts. This is the take-home message of uh, this paper. 
So under physiological conditions, uh, we really need to maintain a proper balance of cholesterol within the cell membrane. And uh, there are regions uh, of uh, uh, cell membranes which are enriched in cholesterol. These are known as lipid rafts. And within lipid rafts, uh, you have uh, the key receptors that are associated with the function of immune cells, and in this case, the genetic cells. For example, uh, MHC class 2. So normally, APOE is produced by dendritic cells uh, is uh, uh, helping uh, in removing uh, the excess of cholesterol from the membranes of dendritic cells. Uh, and this is critical to maintain a proper uh, level of MH MHC class 2 within the cell membrane. If you lack APOE, what is happening that uh, uh, you lack a specific uh, capability of removing cholesterol from the cell membranes uh, this is resulting in the enrichment of uh, lipid rafts uh, together with an increased clustering of MHC class 2 within the cell membranes. At the end, more MHC class 2 increased antigen presentation capability, which is resulting in uh, an increased expansion of CD4 positive T effector memory cells, both in animal models as well as in humans. What I propose you and what I show you is summarizing this paper that we published a few years ago. So if you have questions or curiosities, you can go there and have a look. But now we need to move on. And uh, I'm sure the next question is, uh, Danilo, you mentioned that uh, there are two key acceptors uh, that are critical in uh, promoting uh, the removal of cholesterol from immune cells. And you only presented us the data of animal models lacking APOE. Is it possible to see what is going to happen if we lack both APOE and apolipoprotein A1? So this, is what, this was the next point of our study. So we generated, uh, for the first time, an animal model lacking uh, both apolipoprotein A1 and apolipoprotein E, and look into the phenotype of these mice. And uh, do you remember which was the phenotype in humans lacking apolipoprotein A1? Something like this. This is the phenotype that has been observed in the double knockout mice. So if you compare the double knockout versus the wild type animals, uh, you can see a dramatic accumulation of leptocytes uh, in the skin of these animals, uh, somehow mimicking, uh, together with the accumulation of cholesterol, situations similar to uh, the severe human defect of hypolipoprotein A1. So somehow it's important uh, to have a functional system uh, to really have uh, uh, a proper immune system patrolling uh, the skin uh, against uh, some infectious agents uh, with uh, a proper ability to eliminate uh, cholesterol and drive cholesterol back uh, to the periphery. If this system is not functioning, uh, then you accumulate uh, a lot of immune cells within the skin. You can look closer, uh, and uh, if you look to these cells uh, in uh, the skin, uh, what I'm presenting on uh, the left part of this panel uh, is a foam cell, which is a macrophage that engulfs a lot of lipids, uh, lipid droplets as this one, and they still have some cholesterol crystals deposited within the cytoplasma. If you are a fan of cholesterol crystal, then you know that cholesterol crystal is a key driver of the activation of the inflammasome. So the inflammasome is this system that is supporting the activation of immune cells. And you can clearly see that uh, there is an increase uh, of the deposition of cholesterol crystals uh, in uh, foam cells uh, within the skin of double knockout mice. So again, suggesting an increased uh, inflammatory activation in this setting. And then this is also, also associated with an increased recruitment of lymphocytes. And so we have these foam cells talking to lymphocytes and really increasing the inflammatory response uh, in the skin of this uh, animal model. Of course, as an immunologist, uh, you would ask me, yes, the skin is relevant, but I'm more interested in the classical lymphoid organs. And again, you can see that uh, uh, the lymphoid organs, uh, the brachial lymph nodes, uh, the inguinal lymph nodes, uh, they are really huge as compared to what you can see in a classical wild-type animal, although the spleen is not so different. So suggesting that there are mechanisms uh, in the lymph nodes uh, that are uh, changing the capability of these animals to, to uh, react uh, to a classical immune activation. And indeed, this is the case. Again, this is a comparison between uh, the lymph node of a double knockout mouse compared to wild type animals. Here we uh, stained uh, with uh, a staining that uh, allows you to appreciate the lipid deposition. So all the red dots are indicative of lipid deposition. And you can clearly see that there is a, 
not only an expansion of the lymph nodes, but also a dramatic accumulation of lipids in the lymph nodes of the double knockout mice compared to wild type animals. Is this relevant for the disorder? Yes, indeed. Uh, this work has been published a few months ago. Again, to make a long story short, uh, you uh, can appreciate that there is an increase uh, and a dramatic uh, activation of the immune response uh, in the double knockout mice compared to their uh, counterparts. And uh, this is suggesting uh, that uh, if you are not able uh, to uh, eliminate cholesterol from immune cells uh, in a proper amount, this is resulting in uh, increased immune inflammatory activation. So now it's time for question number three, because I can already see some tired faces uh, on the screen. Uh. So I really need to know how do you feel uh, after the introduction because this was only the introduction. So you can uh, you, you can be like uh, the painting for Munch uh, or you can be like the sleeping beauty in the room. Uh. So I hope I'm not too tiring you too much. Uh. <laughs> Am I boring, uh, Andres? Uh, not too much. Uh, okay, thank you. Let, let, let's see how do you feel. Uh, so most of you so are terrified. Uh, good, good, good to know, but uh, uh, I can see a few numbers. So someone is shy and doesn't want to reply to the, to not participate to, to, to the test. Anyhow, I'm trying to speed up and uh, to change your face, at least from this setting to a better one. <laughs> Normally, this is the, 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 the average, uh, while in this case, I saw that we are more moved on the left. <laughs> so at least uh, we know that cholesterol is critical for inflammation. Uh, cholesterol is critical uh, for immune response. Uh, first of all, uh, think about cell membranes. Uh, as, as we mentioned, uh, we need uh, a lot of cholesterol because cholesterol is a constituent of cell membranes. So every time a cell needs to proliferate, then you need more cholesterol to build up membranes. Cholesterol is critical for intracellular signaling, lipid rats. Also, keep in mind, if I would ask you, uh, do you know the word cholesterol? Yes, of course. Uh, do you know your plasma cholesterol levels? No one knows your plasma cholesterol. You know why cholesterol is important in terms of diseases? <laughs> for cardiovascular diseases. And I suppose... Uh, Everybody knows that you need, you need to be around 200, 180 milligram deciliter of total cholesterol. Now go back to your mobile and look for your blood exams to see which are your levels. Because we know that cholesterol is critical for cardiovascular disorders as it's very important in amplifying the inflammatory response. I'm sure you would ask you, okay, this is nice, but how cholesterol metabolism would affect the adaptive immune response? And now we go to question number four, which is already on your mobile. So if you would like to answer uh, the key point, how should I study the impact of cholesterol on uh, uh, adaptive immune response, uh, which are the cells uh, you would be interested in? The pool is going, I think. So would you study monocytes? Would you study neutrophiles biology? Neurons biology, maybe. It's relevant for uh, adaptive immune response and cholesterol, or maybe lymphocytes. Uh. This is more difficult as compared to the previous question. So, but we are almost to the end. Don't be shy again. We have a few seconds left. Wow, so now you are very well prepared. So you are following me. So lymphocytes, of course, are the key cells that are relevant for studying uh, the role of cholesterol. So what we did uh, to address this point, and uh, then everybody will follow me, very simply, we said, okay, so if we want to study the role of cholesterol metabolism in uh, uh, activated T cells, uh, we know that we both have uh, CD40 cells and CD80 cells. So let's look which are the genes that are uh, changing uh, when we activate either CD40 cells or CD80 cells. And if you look into this panel uh, and uh, you see which are the changes, uh, you see a lot of uh, nice red dots that are uh, pumping up. Uh, and these are all genes associated with cholesterol metabolism that are mainly bumping up uh, in CD80 cells. And specifically, I'm highlighting uh, 
a nice guy known as LDR receptor. The LDR receptor is the receptor which is in the liver, is critical for uh, uh, taking uh, cholesterol from the circulation. So this is a classical receptor, which is very important uh, because uh, it's uh, uh, taking uh, lipoproteins uh, and delivering lipoproteins via the endosome to the lysosome, where then cholesterol is used for many, many, many purposes. As I mentioned before, you cannot accumulate too much cholesterol, so you need to recirculate or reuse your cholesterol through different pathways. And depending on the organ and the tissues, cholesterol can be used for the membranes, can be used to generate bio acids, can be used to generate other sterols, stress hormones, and so on. So the LDR receptor is very important. So why is the LDR receptor increasing in inactivated T cells? And why it could be relevant for CD8 and not for, this, for CD4 T cells? Uh, I know this is a complicated slide. So I do not want to enter into the details of these experiments. But very simply, we compared the activation of CD8 T cells from knockout mice and wild type mice, as well as the response of CD4 T cells from LDR receptor knockout animals versus wild type in terms of proliferation and in terms of cytokine production. Do you see differences in the left panel? Is there something that is attracting your interest? Don't be too shy. At least you can bet your money that perhaps there are differences related to uh, CD80 cells. CD80 cells are proliferating less if they are lacking the LDR receptor and they are producing less uh, cytokines associated with uh, the cytotoxic activity. This is not the case for CD40 cells. This is a simple experiment done in vitro. You take T cells, you incubate with uh, splenocytes, so antigen presenting cells from a different strain. So these are splenocytes from a bulb C animal. And then this is automatically exposing antigens uh, normally recognized as not self from bulb C splenocytes to uh, T cells from a C57 black 6 animal. And therefore, this is uh, uh, inducing uh, the activation of proliferation and uh, the activation of uh, the production of specific cytokines. Is this true also in vivo? I do not want to enter in the details of this experiment, but you can also use an antigen, a specific antigen in vivo. In this case, we use of albumin. And then you can isolate your lymphocytes and test them again in vitro with the same antigen and see whether they acquire memory against the antigen that they have seen in vivo. And under this setting in vivo, if you retest isolated T cells from the lymph nodes of these mice, you see that uh, uh, they are proliferating less uh, if they are lacking uh, the LDR receptor. And again, they are uh, less capable to produce uh, a nice amount of uh, uh, cytokines. So what, what are these data suggesting to us up to now? The LDR receptor is critical for uh, CD8 activation, but not CD4 activation. So when, when we had these results a few years ago, we were stuck and we were thinking, how can we solve the problem? And this is the last question for you. So I want to translate what we are doing and what is going to be your project. What should I do when I have no idea how to develop further my project? Before we move to the last question, which is question number five. So should I repeat the experiment because I'm not satisfied? Should I talk to my supervisor and ask him, please change my project? <laughs> should I run omics or at the end, should I change the job and think I can make more money if I become a dentist? So answers are on the way. Again, do not, don't, not be shy. I know everybody loves to become a dentist. <laughs> You still have some seconds to come to me back, please. Almost there, almost there. Okay, you are very well prepared. Of course, I mean, when you have no idea and you have the money, you say, let's run omics and see whether we can sort out the molecular mechanisms beyond what we are trying to, to, to understand in the system. 
And this is what this is what we did. Uh, we performed uh, an untargeted uh, proteomic uh, to understand the cell signature in uh, uh, CD8 and CD40 cells. Uh, as you can appreciate from the uh, PCA's uh, analysis, uh, while resting uh, T cells, uh, either being CD4 or CD8, uh, they are similar if uh, the LDR receptor is there or not. In activated T cells, uh, there is a clear difference uh, in the pattern of uh, the proteomic signature in activated uh, CD8 T cells lacking the LDR receptors versus those uh, present in the LDR receptor. You can play a lot of the game, you can do everything. Uh, we then combined uh, the analysis of proteomics with metabolomics. And at the end, what we found was that uh, uh, CD8 T cells lacking the LDR receptor, they have a down regulation of uh, a lot of uh, critical uh, metabolic pathways associated with glycolysis, with fatty acid beta oxidation, with glucose degradation and oxidative phosphorylation. So somehow suggesting that something is not uh, properly functional uh, in the mitochondria as well as in the uh, extracellular or in the, sorry, in the cytoplasmic glycolysis pathway in cells lacking the LDR receptor. How can we try to combine everything together? So thinking about the biology of the LDR receptor, as I mentioned before, the LDR receptor is critical to deliver cholesterol in the cell. How can we connect this passage uh, with the reduction of uh, glycolysis and oxidative phosphorylation? There is a nice work which was published in Science a few years ago, showing that uh, uh, you need uh, mTORC1 uh, to be anchored on the surface, on the lysosomal membrane, to be properly functional. And this is uh, happening uh, thanks to the ability of this uh, transporter, SSC38A9, uh, which is sensing arginine uh, and is really helping in attaching mTORC1 uh, on the surface of the lysosome. The missing passage uh, is that uh, uh, SSC38A9 uh, uh, to be uh, stabilized uh, within the membrane of the lysosome uh, would need the proper amount of cholesterol to be there to stabilize the lipid rust. So based on this uh, observation, uh, our working hypothesis was to try to demonstrate whether this could be the case uh, for uh, explaining why the LDR receptor knockout T cells uh, would have been defective in their response. So what we did was to look into uh, mTOR, mTORC1, and all the downstream uh, pathways associated with mTORC1. And uh, uh, you can clearly see very quickly that uh, all pathways downstream of mTORC1 are impaired in CD80 cells, uh, lacking uh, the LDR receptor compared to their wild type counterpart. And this is uh, clear when you activate these cells, uh, so in uh, activated CD80 cells. So this was suggesting that uh, LDR receptor deficiency results in impaired mTOR activation and the metabolic reprogramming. Keep in mind that mTORC1 or mTOR complex is the key sensor for nutrients in any type of cell. So if mTORC is not proper, properly anchored on the surface of the lysosomal membrane, then the cell cannot sense nutrients in another way. So to go further, uh, we look into the uh, presence uh, and the delivery of uh, cholesterol uh, to the lysosomal membrane. Uh, we perform a series of studies. We observed that uh, uh, markers of uh, lysosomes uh, are different in activated T cells lacking the LDR receptor, the uh, red bar, compared to those uh, presenting the expression of the LDR receptor. And this is, was associated with some key changes uh, in all uh, the pathway allowing a proper delivery of cholesterol in the lysosome of uh, CD80 cells. So again, to make a long story short, we published this work last year. So you can, you can go to JCB and have a look to the, the key results. The three take-home the take messages is that the LDR receptor is critical for CD8, but not for CD40 cell activation. Activated CD80 cells rely on cholesterol uptake via the LDR receptor, and the deficiency of the LDR receptor is impairing mTORC activation and metabolic reprogramming in CD80 cells that will be highly relevant. Let's move to the end of my talk, uh, and uh, let's briefly touch uh, on the role of the other big class of lipids, which are triglycerides and fatty acids. 
So in general, we know that uh, uh, these two individuals uh, are mainly different because uh, either uh, they present both visceral adipose tissue, but uh, uh, individuals which are lean, they have a visceral adipose tissue which already present immune cells, uh, but are mainly immune cells that, which are controlling uh, the inflammation of this visceral adipose tissue. So they mainly enriched in uh, T-regulatory cells and uh, anti-inflammatory macrophages or M2-like macrophages. Vice versa, uh, if you look into the visceral, the ATs, visceral adipose tissue of an obese subject, uh, you will see a lot of uh, activated inflamed cells and one macrophages uh, activated T cells. And this is uh, summarized with the simple question, uh, an obese subject uh, is more inflamed. What we asked ourselves a few years ago, is the opposite possible? So is it possible that uh, the uh, visceral adipose tissue per se is producing uh, or is uh, releasing different metabolites that might differently impact uh, T cell activation? And therefore the research question uh, was uh, relatively simple. Uh, we decided to investigate the phenotypic functional and migratory features uh, of memory CD4 T cells uh, in experimental model of uh, uh, fatty acid induced metabolic stress. So we, we combined uh, uh, different type of approaches uh, to try to understand whether there is a priming uh, by uh, adipose tissues and by fatty acids on uh, uh, immune cells. The result of this work is, uh, was published a few years ago on cell metabolism. Again, you can go and have a look and don't want to enter in all the details. The take home message is that uh, obesity is inducing a metabolic stress that is leading to the activation and differentiation of effector memory CD40 cells. And the key player in this response is a PA3 kinase 110 type delta, which is then activated in an AKT dependent response. I would like to leave you with two key findings. Uh, we identified a subset of CD4 T cells, CD4 effector T cells, which are expressing two receptors on the surface, CXCR3, LFA1. And these are a subset, uh, this is a subset of T cells, uh, factor T cells that is uh, uh, activated, highly activated under these conditions. And most importantly, uh, you can run all the mismatch experiments. So you can take dendritic cells uh, from mice that have been exposed to obesity or under wild type conditions. Uh, you can do the opposite experiment, take T cells uh, from obese mice uh, or from lean mice and run all the combinations in this case, uh, the activation of the a 1 p 3 kinase 110 delta AKT signal is only relevant for T cells, CD4 T cells, which are presenting this, uh, this specific uh, phenotype. Is this relevant in human? Uh, I like to, to go translational when it's possible. So what we did in our uh, unit, uh, uh, we have access to a uh, study from the general population so we compare three ladies uh, with uh, same age, 66 years, 66 years of age, that uh, presented the different distribution of fat, you can appreciate by eyes. Uh, so obese ladies, uh, overweight and lean ladies, uh, and we characterize, we profile the different T cell subsets uh, uh, in these ladies. Uh, and uh, we observed a nice correlation between uh, the specific subset of T effector uh, CD4, T effector cells expressing CXCR3 with uh, a parameter of uh, uh, the deposition of adipose tissue, which is the android to genoid area, which is over here. So suggesting even in humans, confirming even in humans that this, sub this, this subset is really relevant for uh, the response. However, and this uh, will be my last point today, if you, I mean, now most of you perhaps have already had lunch, so you are in your postprandial phase. So if you're thinking about an obese subject, the subject is obese anyhow, but then we go through cycles. So we have fasting status and we have feeding status, states. And uh, we wanted to understand whether there's also an acute impact of uh, lipids uh, on uh, the capability of mobilizing immune cells. And to mimic, uh, to mimic this situation, uh, we set up a nice test, uh, and everybody's invited in Milan if you want to do that. So we go through what is called an acute lipid overload. So you need to eat uh, in maximum five minutes uh, a nice and tasty tiramisu, 
which is uh, a bit fat enriched, 95% of fat in this tiramisu. And uh, the key point is that you have to ingest uh, a certain amount of kilocalories adjusted for your body surface. So in my case, my body surface is around two square meters. So uh, uh, when I'm running this experiment, uh, I need to eat this tiramisu is uh, 1,240 kilocalories uh, in five minutes. Uh, and then I'm going to collect my blood. So this is uh, the way your blood will look like uh, at baseline. Uh, and after two hours, this is the way my blood is looking. So we are sure that, uh, I mean, at least I, I was able to enrich my blood in uh, uh, fats. But then we were interested in understanding whether this acute lipid overload uh, can be translated in some key changes in our vascular function, but also in the capability of mobilizing immune cells. Uh, and what we observed was a dramatic increase in overweight subjects in LFA1 positive cells. So immune cells that recently went out from the bone marrow and were released in the circulation. And most importantly, you can look into the different parameters and there was a clearly increase in leukocytes that can be appreciated under acute conditions in this setting in human. This is my profile, so I have no disclosure. My disclosure that I'm showing the data from my blood. And of course, we, we were trying to see whether this can be mimicked, mimicked in animal models. So we set it up an oral lipid tolerance test in animal models. In this case, they are luckier than me. So uh, they are taking it by gavage some olive oil, uh, and uh, we are looking into the increase in plasma triglycerides together with the increase of uh, specific immune cell subsets. And what we found was that uh, under the acute uh, oral fat load, you have a dramatic release in neutrophiles. And uh, uh, we went back and looking into the changes in the bone marrow of these mice. Uh, and uh, you can see a shift. Uh, you have a decrease in all the precursors of neutrophiles. You have an increase of rapid maturation toward the mature neutrophiles that are released in the circulation. And as I promised, uh, uh, this is my last slide, uh, uh, which is the take home message for today. And then we go back to the final results from <laughs> the test. So what I would like you to bring back uh, home today is that immunometabolism is really important, understanding how immune cells uh, are changing their function uh, in relation to their metabolism is, re is relevant. Uh, however, in a uh, real life setting, uh, you always have a cross talk between changes in systemic metabolism versus changes in cellular metabolism. This is relevant under homeostatic conditions. Uh, so you can imagine that you have nutrients metabolized that are influencing the differentiation of uh, your immune cells. Uh, and then uh, uh, up to a certain degree, degree, the plasticity of your immune cells, they can shift between effector and regulatory function. However, under different systemic uh, conditions uh, due to diet, genes, gut microbiota, alter and excessive nutrients intake, uh, then uh, you move uh, toward a setting which has been associated with uh, cardiometabolic and inflammatory disorders. And those are relevant because this uh, uh, mild inflammation is also resulting in uh, changes into the cellular metabolism of immune cells associated with aberrant metabolism, aberrant function, which is not only relevant uh, for uh, cardiometabolic disorders per se, but is also important for infections uh, as well as uh, autoimmune disorders. And with this, I would like to thank all of you for your attention. Uh, this is my dream team, uh, which is helping me with all the data that I presented. And these are the agencies and foundations that are supporting my work. And thank you again for uh, hosting me. Thank you, Andres.